Prime Minister, the Honorable Dr. Terence Drew, members of the cabinet, senior government officials, members of the media, citizens and residents of the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis at home and abroad, good morning and welcome to the first Prime Minister's Press Conference with cabinet ministers for 2023. As is the practice, we ask that all phones be switched to vibrate or silent mode. Thank you. Before we proceed, let's stand for the playing of the national anthem. After which, we will remain standing as we call on Pastor Donna Pete Polanco to invoke God's presence on today's proceedings. Pleasant good morning to everyone. Would you remain standing with me? We thank God today. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and we will be glad in it. Amen. We serve a good and a wonderful God and we just want to give him thanks today. Bow your heads with me. Father, we thank you, dear God, for you are such a good God, oh God. Father, we bless you. Lord, we honor you. We lift you up, oh God. We exalt you. Father, we put you first, dear God, Lord, in all that we do. For, Lord, you said, God, that if we would put you first, that everything else, dear God, would be added unto us. And, Father, we thank you, Lord, for, oh, God, this press conference today. We thank you, God, for bringing us here together safely. Father, we pray, dear God, that you would be in the midst of us. Lord, we welcome your presence, dear God. For, Lord, we know that we can do nothing without you. Father, we pray, O oh God, Lord, that you would bless, Lord, the parliamentary representatives, O oh God, that are here today. Father, we pray, God, that you would help them, Lord. Father, even in their responses, O oh God, in their deliberations. Father, we pray that you give them guidance, that you give them wisdom and knowledge, O oh God, that you give them understanding. Father, we arrest, O oh God, Lord, even, God, every spirit, O oh God, of the enemy right now in the name of Jesus. And Father, we pray, O oh God, Lord, let your perfect, O oh God, will be done, God. Let your will be established, O oh God, for the good of the nation. For Father, you have called them to the nation, O oh God, hallelujah, for such a time as this. Father, continue, dear God, to unction them, to function, Lord, in their capacity. Father, we pray, O oh God, even for those that are here from the press, O oh God. Father, we pray, Lord, for patience, dear God. We pray, Lord God, that you would guide, Lord, direct, Father, everything that will be said and done. And Father, we give you thanks. We give you all the honor. We give you all the glory. We give you praise in Jesus' name. And everybody says, Amen. God bless you. Please be seated. Thanks, Pastor Polanco. A good morning once again. Allow me to introduce the head table. From my right, Prime Minister and Minister of Finance, National Security, Citizenship and Immigration, Health and Social Security, the Honorable Dr. Terence Drew. Attorney General and Minister of Justice and Legal Affairs, the Honorable Garth Wilkin. Minister of Public Infrastructure and Utilities, Transport, 
Information, Communication and Technology, and Post, the Honorable Conris Maynard. Minister of Tourism, Labor, Civil Aviation and Urban Development, the Honorable Marsha Henderson. Minister of Agriculture, Fisheries, Marine Resources, Cooperatives, Entrepreneurship, and the Creative Economy, the Honorable Samuel Duggins. Minister of Sustainable Development, Environment, Climate Action and Constituency Empowerment, the Honorable Dr. Joy L. Clark. Junior Minister of Youth Empowerment and Social Development, Gender Affairs, Aging and Disabilities, the Honorable Iseline Phillip. Deputy Prime Minister, the Honorable Dr. Jeffrey Hanley, sends his apologies. He is currently attending an event with the Caribbean Development Bank. He will join us shortly. Senior Minister and Minister of Foreign Affairs and Avi Foreign Affairs, sorry, Economic Development, International Trade and Investment, and Industry and Commerce, the Right Honorable Dr. Denzel Douglas, is currently away on government duties. The main thrust of today's press conference is to update citizens and residents on a number of matters of national importance including the 2023 budget and the projected plans and projects for 2023. This government commits to leading with transparency and integrity and resolves to keep the nation abreast of the decision-making process and accomplishments thus far. I now invite the Honorable Prime Minister, Dr. Terence Drew, to present his opening statement. Thank you very much, Master of Ceremonies. And let me say good morning to all, to all the citizens of St. Kitts and Nevis, those listening by radio, internet, those home and those abroad. I want to, of course, also say to the press, um, who is here with us this morning, um, and to those who are the technical people, and let me reflect as well on the pastor who gave the invocation and of course the ministers or members of the federal cabinet who were all recognized by the master of ceremonies this morning. I want to say a happy new year to all of you and to wish you the very best for 20. 23. Let me say that your government has been working around the clock to fulfill the pledges we made to you during our 2022 election campaign. Our pledges are based on our seven foundational pillars, which are food security, green energy transition, economic diversification, sustainable industries, the creative economy, COVID-19 recovery, and social protection. As I've mentioned before, I've joined, I'm joined by my fellow cabinet members, and each will give an update as to the progress and plans of their various ministries for this year. We made a pledge to govern with transparency, integrity, and accountability and we intend to continue to keep that pledge. The St. Kitts Nevis Labour Party was in the vanguard of the investments made by nas our national political heroes to improve the quality of life and health of our people. This founding principle remains the bedrock of our administration. We are committed to serve with the sole purpose of ensuring that every, every policy Every plan, every project is for the betterment of all. Our mission is to transform the lives of our people by advancing our economy in ways that will provide greater socioeconomic opportunities. I would like to say at this time that our citizenship by investment program has been transitioning and it has been transitioning well 
under the leadership of our new CEO, Mr. Michael Martin. And at this time, I want to thank the past CEO for his contribution. I would also like to add that there are a number of critical areas, but I would leave those areas for the ministers, whether it be energy, water, tourism, the good governance agenda, agriculture, the creative economy, youth, sports, education. But in my opening statement, I want to touch fundamentally on the issue of health care. Now, January 30th this year will mark the 80th anniversary of the 1935 Buckley's Uprising. This event marked a turning point in our social, economic, and political journey to self-determination and nationhood. Blood, sweat, and tears were shed to improve health and healthcare services, as among other things. Your government understands the history of workers' struggles and the sacrifices they would have made. And one such hero is Joseph N. France of Mount Lily Nevis, whose name proudly stands on our general hospital. Let me say that the, from the onset that the JNF hospital has its strengths and weaknesses. And of course, there's always room for improvement. And as was promised, it will be converted into an excellent tertiary care, secondary tertiary care institution. But I want to take this opportunity to thank all of those who work so tirelessly hard at the JNF hospital, whether they are nurses, doctors, lab technicians, x-ray persons, phlebotomists, they work in the lab, whether they are the cooks, those who maintain the, 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 the grounds, those who clean. Whatever role persons play at the hospital, I want to thank them for their service. I want to also thank as well, those who are now coming in to really administer uh, the direction of the hospital. I would like to say that your government welcomes any critique and recommendations with respect to the hospital or healthcare. We inherited a health workforce with many who are competent and dedicated to duty. They were seriously tested during the COVID and the healthcare workers, we must admit, they did their best. So on behalf of a grateful nation, I wish to express profound appreciation to the health personnel who put themselves, their, themselves on, their line, on the line and also their, their families when they risk exposure to the COVID when we did not even fully understand the extent uh, to which it would have affected us. So I think they need to be honored for that and that is why we decided that they should get an honorarium. However, I must state that the staff and medical professionals function under a culture of repression, oppression, and suppression. So much so that the planning meetings were the exceptions rather than the norm. Verbal abuse had become the norm. Being passed over for promotion and training had also been a serious problem at the hospital. Lack of meaningful communication as well. Medical doctors were working on this step. That had become a norm, and you remember when I criticized that. Workers were afraid to talk. In the circumstances, highly qualified, competent, and experienced personnel left the service. And so we are saying that the culture must change. By August 2022, the lab staff had declined by about 50%, and we found no concerted effort, really, to replenish that. In short order, a situation analysis was done. The strong and weak areas identified and recommendations made. One such recommendation remained to be fully addressed, and that is to recruit new specialists, meaning technicians, therapists, technologists, doctors, and nurses, which we have started thus far. That work is in progress, and it is already resulting in positive results. There was no principal nursing officer for seven years. That is a serious breach in the administration of nursing care. We are now in the process of quickly correcting that as we have now circulated ads to get persons interviewed to take that critical position up. There was no director of health institutions. This was corrected in mid-September 
when we appointed um, Dr. Jensen Morton to the position um, as, as well. I mean, as well as having a person who will deal with operations, who is, that, that person is Mrs. Maynard. To date, we have made sure that the Sandy Point Hospital has a full cadre of medical professionals, uh, doctors rather, when this used to be done on a call basis. The issue at Mary Charles is also being quickly addressed to make sure that at that hospital also there will be doctors who can treat the patients who would access care there. We are currently, of course, advancing the training of the medical health professionals. Over 250 healthcare workers were trained in ACLS, BLS, and PALS. These are training that are necessary for any doctor to practice. Over 250, as many had been practicing without the requisite certification. I also wish to announce that we are already making moves to upgrade the EMS so that those who work as EMTs can advance themselves to become paramedics and offer better health care for our people. When we did the audit of the JNF, we recognized quickly that when it came to the financial operations that JNF had become severely wanted in that area. We recognized that we imagine we had owed suppliers significant amount of money, some of whom were threatening not to continue to supply the JNF, but we would have said to them this is a critical um, situation and we would need them, and so they continue to do so as we are resolving that problem. So the hospital situation was analyzed and your government acted fast to prevent things from falling apart. Two lines of action are now ongoing, stabilization and transformation. That is what we are doing right. Both require new staff, new systems, and a new culture of empathy, respect, collaboration, and excellence. And of course, all of this would require some amount of resources. I want to take this opportunity to say that Dr. Jensen Morton, the new director of health institutions, inherited, among other matters, a lack of equipment in the eye clinic. This means the eye clinic has not been able to perform critical surgeries, but we rectify that quickly by investing over $700,000 to purchase new equipment so that we can start doing at least cataract surgery. Presently, there are no cataract surgeries being done in St. Kitts and Nevis, which means that persons are blind, are all going blind, and we are seeking to address that as quickly as possible. With respect to the MRI, as I've said, we have ordered that, and that is being built to be shipped to us as quickly as possible. Also want to say that Dr. Morton inherited two lawsuits and the matter of a seriously ill victim that we are working through as well. And therefore, I want to say today that Dr. Jensen Morton, along with his team, are working very hard to correct a lot of ills that had become a fundamental part of what the JNF was or is. And I want to congratulate him for what he's doing and you will definitely see the results of that hard work. And so I want to say a number of critical things that are being done within the Ministry of Health, one of them being we are getting ready to start the universal health care, where we'll start to communicate with our people, as we spoke about universal health care for all our people. We are looking at corporatization, corporatization of the JNF so that we can properly um, continue to manage it, to improve its management as well. We are looking to strengthen our partnerships that we have with CAFA, PAHO, and a number of NGOs such as PALS, so that all can be a part of our new trajectory going forward. So if you were to ask me, I'm quite pleased with the significant changes that are being made, with the systems that are being put in place, so that all these long-standing problems within the health sector can start to be addressed. And some of these, of course, incre include putting in critical members of the workforce, which is a PO, and to ensure also that there is a director of health institutions. And as we go along, I want the public to join us as we transform our healthcare sector here in St. Kitts and Nevis. I would end my opening statement there, and to the other sectors, I will leave it up to the other ministers, and the press would have much more time to ask questions as of us as we seek to move our country and nation forward. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Honorable Prime Minister. We will now open the floor for questions. Kindly note the following guidelines. All questions will be directed to the Prime Minister, who will then delegate to the relevant ministers to respond accordingly. When you approach the mic, kindly state your name and the media house you represent. Each journalist will be allowed to ask two questions at a time to allow for the smooth flow of the proceedings and to give the members adequate time to respond. Let me also recognize those media houses on the virtual platform. If you have a question, please use the raise your hand function or you can type your question in the chat box and I will acknowledge and facilitate accordingly. At this point, we welcome our first journalist in-house. Good morning, Prime Minister and other members of Cabinet. Good morning. Good morning um, Mr. <laughs> very good. <laughs> I'm Glenn Bart, um, SK Newsline. Um, my first two questions. Um, I must admit that um, they're both in parts, really. Um, CBI, um, part, I have three parts. Passports, can you give an update on the number of passports issued to economic citizens over the past year? And if you can, compare that number to some previous years. Um, secondly, what is the plan for ending the real estate problem where Persons apparently were receiving their citizenship, and you can confirm that or, or not. But at the same time, the investment into a project, um, that project becomes dormant or incomplete in, in some form. Um, how are you addressing that issue? Can you update us on the prison project involving, and give us an indication as to how many passports have been issued or, or citizenship have been granted? Um, on that project, what's the status? My second question relates to Christopher Harbour and Petition Hill. Um, what is the status of the loans that were issued by the SIDF to these two entities? And uh, secondly, in the case of Christopher Harbour, um, are the developers still continuing um, in, 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 the, in the program to develop the particular area? Um, can you give an update on, on the status? Those are my two questions for now. Right, thank you very much. So I'll answer the last one, and I'll leave the CBI one um, for the AG who was leading on the changes that we were seeking within that program. With respect to the SIDF, I would say from the onset, the ex SIDF has not forgiven any loan. I want to make that clear. The SIDF has its interest in the Christoph Harbor. We know that. And it owns about 30% of that development presently. And that is where it resides, the ownership, with the SIDF, well, at 30%. So there's no forgiveness, of it, neither from the SIDF standpoint or from the Petition Hill standpoint. So I just wanted to, to make that clear. Christopher Faber? Yes, well, Christopher Faber, yes, it's, it, it's a still a viable project. It is a project that is seeking, of course, new investments and so forth. And as a result of that, there is a need or almost um, they are seeking to have new investment, let me say that, so that the project can reach its fruition. But I would say that we own, the SIDF, sorry, owns 30% of it, that is its interest in the project. The project continues and now they are seeking now to move the project um, further along. But the fundamental question I think that is in this is what has happened with respect to monies from the SIDF. I'm telling you that the position is the SIDF still has its interest right in there. Nothing has been relinquished. And Kitishan Hill as well. Right. And the, 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 the SIDF has not forgiven any of those loans that it would have given, or its interest still remains. With respect to the CBI, um, I would allow the AG to answer that one as he led the, 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 the legal transformation on it. And then 
you also ask a question with respect to numbers. Those are very specific. I would advise that you would be able to get those numbers through the office. I will seek to see if I can get them. But these are very specific questions. However, what I can say is that the project, the, SA, the CBI program continues and um, the AG will address some of the changes that it would have gone through recently and those would address your questions. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. In relation to the question about real estate under the CBI program, why certain projects were not constructed, that was one of the fundamental conversations that we had when the Attorney General's Chambers undertook to examine the legislation, see where we can close, could close the loopholes that existed in the CBI regulation. Now, after discussions with all the stakeholders on the 23rd of December last year, new regulations were gazetted. In those regulations, what developers are required to do now is that they, are, they have to place money received from the sale of real estate units into an escrow account. And the administration of the Citizenship by Investment Program will now monitor um, the progress of the projects such that a developer does not sell 20 units, for example, and not build anything. What will happen is that money will go into escrow, and when the developer has proved that they have, for example, finished a foundation, then a certain amount of money will be released. If they prove that they reach to the roof stage, a certain amount of money will be released. Um, that process was not completed in the past, and that is why we have a lot of white elephants in the country, meaning projects that started or were funded by citizenship by investment um, funds, and they simply were not completed. The, the other element of the new regulations that was created to prevent that from happening again is that not only is there escrow process that will be enforced seriously, there will also be a distribution of units process. So for example, if you are a developer and you believe that you can sell 1,000 real estate units, or 1,000 buildings in your real estate um, project, you will not be given access to sell those 1,000 units at the beginning of your project, like was done in the past. What you will do, you will be given a certain amount of units, for example, 50. You'll be able to put those on the market. And until you complete a certain phase of your construction, you will not get the next 50. So there will be a staggered approach to the actual issuance of the units that you can sell on the market. And all of that was done to prevent what has happened in the past, such that real estate developers were selling off plan and then building one part of their project and not completing the project. So that was, uh, as I said, a fundamental aspect of the revision and the strengthening of the legislation with respect to the CBI program. And we believe that the structure that has been created will prevent that from happening in the past. One of the other aspects of the regulations that seeks to deal with that issue is that there shall, there, the legislation provides that there shall be no deductions from the minimum contribution that a person must make to be able to apply for citizenship. Meaning, the real estate option requires an investor to pay $200,000 to the developer. The developer cannot take out any money out of that $200,000. That $200,000 must go into the escrow. We did that because in the past, we were, we were told that market forces controlled what was done in the CBI. What we are saying is what controls the CBI is our regulation. So if you want to purchase a unit in a development for $200,000, you come with your $200,000, you put that into escrow, and all of the other fees that you pay, government fees, agency fees, everything else that is paid must be on top of that 200000 So the 200000 actually goes into the project. And that is one of the elements that we sought to tighten up with the, um, the new regulations. Since the regulations were, were gazetted, 
we had further discussions in this very room with the service providers, the local service providers, as well as the developers. Um, very fruitful, frank discussions, um, which they, they were happy to have with us. And there are a couple of things that we are going to address and we are going to amend the regulations very shortly just to address those small <coughs> issues that were raised. But I can tell you that the local service providers and the, the local developers and international developers are very happy with the strengthening of the program because real developers, meaning the persons who actually want to build projects and create jobs and create construction in the country, are now able to do it given the structure of the new regulation. I hope that's answered your question, Mr. Bart. Thank you, Prime Minister Drew and uh, AG. This question now comes from Vaughan Radio. There are two questions. The first question, under the former Team Unity-led administration, it was agreed that the island of Nevis will receive $60 million a year from the CBI proceeds. Does that arrangement still exist? Part B to the question, are negotiations continuing to work out an equitable amount for Nevis? Question two, concerning former Minister of Government, Lindsey Grant's matter at the last lap bar in 2022, although he has been charged with two offenses, has a trial date been set? All right, um, thank you um, very much for that. I would say that what existed with respect to the St. Kitts Nevis arrangement, there was what you call budgetary support of, I think, $500, $5 million per month. That still continues. However, in speaking to the Premier, he and I met very early in the term, and we had decided that we are going to put a committee together. That committee will look at matters of the relationship of St. Kitts and Nevis, the revenue sharing arrangement. As you know, the Constitution speaks to the, the revenue that you get through tax. It doesn't speak to non-taxable revenues, um, such as the CBI program. And so that committee is being put together. Just recently, I spoke to the Premier again, and he has said, once he has given his throne speech, that and I think it's this week, might be tomorrow, that that will sit to make sure that that committee comes together. We're going to seek external help from the experts who understand the relationship in a federation between the entities and how that arrangement can be strengthened. So we are not going to just look at it from the revenue standpoint or the sharing of revenues, but we're going to look at the constitution and seek help in terms of how that should be done. So the questions of equity, we are seeking to settle those, and that is one. So once the committee is formed, that committee will be announced to the country. They will get to work with a specific mandate, a few of which I mentioned in my statement uh, previously, to make sure that we can resolve um, that matter. Thank you, P PM. AG? In relation to the, the criminal action, um, the Attorney General's Office provides administrative support for the Office of the Director of Public Prosecution. It does not direct the office. Um, from what I know about the matter, the Acting Director of Public Prosecutions has engaged an independent outside prosecutor to take carriage of that matter so that there's no um, semblance of belief that there's some political interference with the matter. Um, I do not know about the progress of the matter, as I said, because we do not, as from the Attorney General's office, involve ourselves directly in criminal prosecution. So I will, I will um, the, that question from the media house is properly to be directed to the director, the acting director of public prosecutions. And on that note, we are actively recruiting a full-time director of public prosecutions. We have sent out ads throughout the region We've already received applications from strong candidates, and that process should be completed within the next few weeks so that the, the, a substantive director of public prosecutions, strong one, can be brought in um, to relieve the, the also strong prosecutor 
that is acting in the post. So um, I want to clarify that because um, I had put out a notice last year that we, that the previous director of public prosecutions, his contract ended and, it was, and he did not renew it. So, um, so that there's no issue in the public domain, just know that we are actively recruiting. And if you know anyone that is capable, that is strong, that is independent, uh, a good prosecutor, please let them know. Um, we need everyone to mark it for us because we want good people in these very important constitutional roles. Thank you, A.G. Wilkin. The next question will come from an in-house media. Good morning, Jason Davis, ZIZ Broadcasting Corporation. My questions, first of all, are government auxiliary workers pensionable? If not, are there any plans to make them pensionable? Second question, can we get an update on the traffic lights in Bird Rock as they remain inoperative? Right. Because that is a big answer with yes. respect to the traffic lights. Right. Thank you very much for the question. There was an issue um, with one of the proprietors in the area um, that needed to be resolved amicably. Um, I, I can't report that it is um, completely resolved as yet, and so that is what has delayed the implementation of the traffic lights. It is about where someone can turn to get into an establishment and the arrangement of how it will not affect that business. So I will endeavor to give a further update um, to see where that is at this moment. In relation to the government auxiliary workers, uh, that was very high. I think that was one of the first things that the Prime Minister sent down to the Attorney General's chambers. What happens, there's a bit of a conflict with the legislation and what was the intended policy. So our team is currently working on resolving that, that issue so that there is clarity moving forward. And I know it is, it is a prime, of prime, primary importance to the Prime Minister as well as the head of the civil service that that matter be resolved because there are persons that um, were promised that they would receive pensions who have not gotten them. And um, I, I can promise you that we will provide the necessary legal advice from the Attorney General's office so that a firm decision can be made by cabinet moving forward with respect to the government auxiliary employees. Thank but you. I, sorry, I, I don't like to give timelines, but it is actively being done. I, I would not say no, no more than four to six weeks. Thank you. Let me recognize the arrival of the Deputy Prime Minister, Minister of Education, Youth, Social Development, Gender Affairs, Aging and Disabilities, the Honorable Dr. Jeffrey Hanley. Our next question will come from an in-house media. Good morning, Rashan Dixon, St. Kitts News Observer. Um, I'm seeking a follow-up from the last presser where I asked about the total number of CBI applications. We haven't had an update since 2018. And the, the total number of applications processed and the number signed off by your administration and the breakdown of the nationalities. And now my questions for today. Um, Mr. PM, I think you missed Mr. Bat's question and the update for the prison project. Um, adding on to that, has the, your administration signed off on any new shares for that project? And what has been the, the share price for, for, for passports under that project. And also, you spoke of plans to wean the Federation of its dependency on the CBI program. How achieve, achievable is this, considering how inflated the economy, the economy may have become um, due to the benefits of that program? And how long do you think um, the Federation would, be, would, would take to, to, to be weaned off that program? All right, thank you very much for that. With respect to the prison project, we are evaluating um, that project still. Remember that project had an agreement to it which had bound the government to some extent as well and work had already been, had already been started. So we are bound to that to some extent. Um, the other thing with respect to the total number of CBI, we, as you know, went through a whole transition. We now have 
a new CEO of the, of the unit who has done an audit with respect to those questions. You're asking very specific questions as to the number, the amount, and the number um, of passports or citizenship associated with a particular project, how much we gave, and so forth. So those numbers, I will direct you to, to get the answers um, to that so that we can have, you can have closure to that. And now that we have gone through the transition and the audit is being done, those questions now would be able to be answered. As you know, we went through um, that transition. With respect to the weaning, let me address that. It's not that we don't think the CBI program is important. It's fundamental. It's important. I think what I want to clarify here is not to, that the CBI program would not continue to be a part of nation building and advancement, but that our dependence on it we can, is, should not be where it is at this point in time. So what we are doing is diversifying the economy so that we can have other sectors that are strong and contributing to the overall development and advancement and that CBI. When we came into office, CBI was about 50 to 60 percent. I mean, that is extremely high. Means, therefore, that a number of the other sectors within the economy had fallen back, and so we are strengthening those. For example, we are strengthening agriculture. We are strengthening our tourism product. We are strengthening new investment and investment that we are seeking. We are seeking investments that are not predicated on the CBI program. And some of those investments we will announce very, very shortly. But we want our people to know that the CBI program, we have strengthened it because it is a critical part. And we are not saying it should go away. And we don't want it to go away. But what we want to do is to diversify our economy so that we make sure that we have multiple legs standing on and not fundamentally one leg so that leg is knocked out or become affected adversely negatively that we suffer more than we should we are looking at our energy sector energy as a sector to which the minister will speak to and so the ministers here can speak to their own ministry and most of them have projects are ah, seeking um, investments to advance um, our country economy to diversify so we are seeking diversification as part of our new thrust. But we understand that CBI is a fundamental part and we seek to strengthen it, to protect it, so that it can continue to help in nation building. Thank you, Prime Minister. Good morning, Devon Cornelius, WinFM. Uh, what is the status of the <coughs> coroner's inquest into the deaths of Customs Officer Andrew Douglas? and Stonefoot resident, Sandra Adams. And during the final budget day on December 19th, Prime Minister Drew revealed that there were some cases of illegal marriages taking place in the country and noted that an investigation will be carried out to uncover other possible cases. What is the status of that investigation? Thank you. Right, I'll speak to the, to the last one because that is under um, my ministry, of course that a committee has been put together to evaluate this. The AG is part of that committee, along with the PS, persons from the police force and immigration, to look at these type of marriage. I have, about, I have boxes of these type of marriages in my office, boxes of them. I need help to lift those boxes up. And I say that to say how serious a matter this situation really is. We, as a labor administration, we believe in immigration. We are not anti-immigration at all. Most people can remember, those of you who are here from, of Guyanese descent, or of descent from, let's say, the Republic, you know that we had always been an open administration. But we believe that it should be governed by laws, and that the laws should be respected. No country that is worth its salt here in um, is worth salt would have an immigration process without rules and regulations, without laws. And we are saying that while we are open to immigration, we cannot allow the system to be abused. I mean, it was so bad. I mean, people go to get married, and when the magistrate asks them to kiss. You have the bride saying, no, 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 no kiss. <laughs> I mean, it got bad like that. Or you ask 
What is the name of your husband? I call him babe. It got that bad. So we have hundreds of them. So what we want is that people go through the normal process. We want to help those. As a matter of fact, and, and they divorce again. So what they come, they get married, divorce, and married again. And then people had timeline, like one, some, one person said, well, my date for my divorce is coming up. <laughs> so, so the marriage is scheduled and the divorce is scheduled. And we have hundreds of those, um, and we are still searching. We are, we're sure we're going to find much more. So we are saying to those who want to come to St. Kitts, we are not anti-immigration. We have always had an open immigration policy. But we want people to follow the rules and regulations. And we are extremely disappointed that this took place under the past administration. It was facilitated. Yes, after they are married, they go straight to register to vote. So everything takes place in one. Um, everything takes place in one day. So you get married, and they get, it's almost like a chain. As soon as you get married, you get that. When you get that certificate, you go on um, to register, I think. You go up to the health center, you got register. Then you go after that, you get your passport quickly. Then after you get your passport, you go and you register to vote. So it was a ring that was established. And we are saying where we pick up that people's Citizenship will be taken back and their names will be taken off of the registration of voters because if the marriage is illegal, the citizenship is illegal, so it means your registration is illegal as well. And so we are going to bring that to an end. But at the same time, we are going to put an amnesty in place because we understand that there are good actors within the, immig the immigrant community to give them an opportunity to register properly and to say to them that we are not an inhumane government or administration, that we want to treat them like human beings as they should be treated, that we care about them as well, but they must also understand that we must follow our laws, rules, and regulations. And I met with the Dominican community, the Republic, and I said to them exactly that, that we will follow the laws and give them fair opportunities to become residents and citizens of St. Kitts and Nevis. But where we, find, where, where we find that they would have broken the law, we will have to take action because we are a country of laws as well. And I met with over 100 plus and I said that to them. So they understand where we stand. So we're going to have to follow the law, but at the same time, we have to show that we are compassionate and we understand that the past through COVID, money was tight and they could not keep up in terms of the payment and so forth. We want to respect that as well. And if people are going to get married for the right reasons, of course, get married. And through that marriage, you, are, you can have access to our citizenship. We still encourage once you follow the law. That is all that we are asking with respect to our immigration trust. Thank you. His first question, A.G. Mr. Cornelius, I, I think you have some trouble because I am reading your mind. And I knew you were going to ask me that, so I spoke to the commissioner this morning. The coroner's inquest, the first one in relation to the, the, the young man at Customs, that began last year. It was adjourned over the holidays, and it will continue. When that one is completed in the magistrate's court, then the other inquest that you inquired about at the last press conference will then proceed. Thank you. This next question comes from Vaughn Radio. As the government is revamping the PAP program, can we have an update on that? I think the minister responsible for the PAP program is now here. Thank you um, very much. Um, we had uh, close to 1,200 applications. 12,000, sorry. 12,000 applications for the the PAP initiative, the Ministry of Social Development, the entire team is doing the verification process right now, checking with all of the agencies, including Social Security, 
making sure that um, the social security numbers are correct, the information that persons shared are accurate. We are hoping that we can restart by the end of this month after certain verification would have taken place. Of course, we are focusing on some categories in terms of priority areas. For example, those persons who are not working, those who are unemployed, that's a, a category of priority. Our seniors and persons with disabilities, and then we'll deal with those who are employed but working for under the 3,000 um, target that we would have threshold that we would have mentioned. Thank you, Deputy Prime Minister. We'll now have our next question from an in-house media. If there are no more questions, Mr. Bart. Um, uh could the Prime Minister clarify the matter of the 30% SIDF um, involvement in Christopher Harbour? Are you saying that, that SIDF has shares in Christopher Harbour as a company? Okay, all right. Um, I understand that... So, um, so basically, if Christopher Harbour is worth about $600 million now, 30% of that belongs to SIDF. All right, and they are and they are repaying the loan that was granted initially, huh? and they are repaying the loan as well. Right, they, right. So you are asking a question about a loan that the monies that were given. I'm saying that the SIDF has more than that. The SIDF has owns 30 percent of the project as it actually stands at this point in time. So I know you are referring to because there was some big thing going around that SIDF is forgiving a loan to Christopher Harbour. I am saying that that is not so at this particular time. Right. Uh, there is also um, talk going around that um, the Development Bank of St. Kitts and Nevis that um, there are no funds available for loans, student loans, uh, that some students are finding out very late that um, that they have lost their application um, fee. So can you explain what has happened there and what, and what is to be, um, what is to follow? Right. Um, just one more thing. Uh, the Minister of Tourism, if I can get an update on two things. The airport, um, with regards to the parking apron and the proposed design for the new terminal building. What is happening um, with regards to that? And then secondly, there are, I think, at least three properties that we'd like to get an update on. Pirate's Nest, Ramada, and there is a development by a Chinese um, entity near camps of um, or West Palm. And I'm not sure of the name of, of, of the project. Um, if you can give an update as to what really is happening with those three projects. And uh, my last... My last question relates to a, a citizen of St. Kitts and Nevis who has been having some problems with the National Housing Corporation with regards to a land issue. And apparently, um, he has been pursuing this matter for over a year. And, a, and he is saying to me that it seems to be now a policy of ignoring him, not responding um, to him. I would like to know if um, that is the kind of normal operation that is to be expected from NHC. Um, can you explain what is really happening uh, in terms of land issues? All right. Um, I would, right. You asked about the student loans. I'll quickly answer that. But the Minister for NHC is here. And the Minister for Tourism is here. And those projects you're talking about, I suspect they are projects through the CBI program that you're asking about. 
and so I will, I will do that. Let me quickly answer and turn it over to the others um, quickly. The student loan matter is a student, is a serious matter. As we said that when we got in, we had to quickly strengthen the development bank. I did not reveal what we had found before because I did not want people to lose confidence in the bank. And so I will start out by saying we have strengthened the bank. The bank is viable. We have made sure. We have a small business program being pursued there, and the bank is carrying out a number of activities. The bank was badly managed. A lot of, mm -hmm. that's an understatement. A lot of corrupt practices took place in the bank. There was a run on the bank. There was a mafia approach to how the bank functioned. The bank was left badly damaged. And so we had to quickly stabilize the bank. So I want to say that the bank is stable once again. On the matter of student loan, we have recognized that. We have to do some refinancing. We have, I set up in the last cabinet, which took place on Monday, we actually discussed that in cabinet. We are now the Directorate of the bank is meeting with Ministry of Finance, the FS specifically, and they are putting forward a plan to deal with student loan. We are not just going to deal with finance, financing student loans. We also want to look at the student loan interest rate. And we are proposing that that rate should come down for a very reasonable amount so that our young people can have access to loans that are affordable as they pursue their education. A lot of people who come back with student loans of very high interest sometimes have to live in their parents' home until they're 40 because they can't handle the payment and still live independently. We are very aware of this. And so we want when people study and come back to contribute that they can enjoy the rewards of their sacrifices. Don't have to wait until they're in their midlife to start to enjoy that. And so we are going to look at the interest rate and look at financing. And so that is something that we are looking at. And we'll have an answer very, very quickly with respect to student loans. So I want to say to our students that we are moving quickly to address the situation. And the bank is meeting with Ministry of Finance so that we can move forward. I now turn it over to the Minister of Tourism and then the Minister of Education. And then we can touch on the project. Good morning, all. Thank you for the question, Mr. Bass. Uh, so in respect to the apron, we had to first uh, dismantle the COVID Welcome Center. I don't know if you've been following. Work was going on there. I think it's about just two weeks now. They're about since the center has been dismantled as that area on the apron as well needed to be repaired. Uh, I am pleased to say, however, that based on the amount of work that we've been putting in to advance the challenges with airlift, it has caused us to be in a predicament now. Uh, for the, no, that is in terms of when uh, the repairs would be effected. So if you have been following as well, you would see that for the winter season, we've had an increase in the number of aircrafts here at the airport. Uh, that, are the, that is the legacy carriers as well as private aircraft. Now, the part of the apron that needs repairing are some of the carriers like Jet, uh, forgive me, Delta, uh, United, and the, the aircraft that are not so heavy are using that particular strip on the aircraft. And so we have to strategically plan when we are going to effect the repairs. We suspect that we should be in a position to do so by the end of February. Uh, we would have less flights coming in at that time. Um, we are going to be taking bids as well. The board has decided that they're going to put it out, the, the tender out for bids as well. So you should be hearing from us shortly in terms of the repairs there. Thank you um, very much, uh, Ms. Sabat. In relation to the question or the concern, I am not aware of that issue. And what I will say 
to you or if the person is listening that they should visit the NHC cooperation tomorrow so that we can work on that matter in relation to their having ongoing issues with the, uh, their land. At least I am not aware of maybe that specific case, but what I can say, we would have inherited a cooperation with a lot of irregularities where lands were distributed and were not done correctly. So that is, in fact, causing some issues in terms of ownership of the land. What we have done as a board and as a ministry, as of next month, we are going to have an in-house lawyer assigned working at the National Housing Cooperation to, to address those issues. So, after you can share the name, and then we invite the person tomorrow to see how well we can fix that. Thank you. Uh, just to follow up, Mr. Bat, I think I forgot to mention, and the CAPSEC just reminded me, uh, to, I think you asked about the new plans. Well, when we... When I came in as the new minister, we were provided with some plans uh, that were there prior. The new plans, of course, we've outgrown. What the new plans did were just to expand. Uh, we have obviously outgrown the footprints of the space. There were no provisions for jet bridges and those things. So I suspect we are going to have to go back and revise those plans to facilitate the demands that are coming. In terms of the interim plan, like I mentioned earlier, for uh, packing of the carriers, the, the aircrafts, the, we have discussed it, like I said, with the relevant stakeholders, the agents here on the ground, and it has been working. So we are hoping to have the issue, re the, the issue resolved comprehensively in terms of reviewing the plans provided and working with updating the existing uh, sites so that uh, we can continue to operate there. So in terms of the apron, like I said, within the, within, within the next three to four months, we should be able to commence work. But in the interim, the plan has been working. Mr. Bart, in relation to your question about Pirate's Nest. Not a question. Oh, sorry. sorry. What were you We're saying? Yes, and that is CBI related in terms of the properties, the, the projects with Pirates Nest and Ramada and the Chinese development. Those are CBI related projects. So I suspect that AG is going to give you the answer. Your, your question was tourism related or what is the status of the construction of those projects? Okay, so what, what the new um, CBI regulations contemplate is that, um, as I'll use the language of one of the developers when we had the meeting, we have a proof of life process. So all CBI approved developments have to reapply to, sh to the, the Board of Governors, which, which governs projects, to then determine where they are in construction and where they want to go, so that then potentially the CBI program can facilitate these projects being completed so that they could now enter into the tourism product or the home product in the country. So that proof of life process is, is going on now. The window is right now in the middle, middle of February. So these projects that you named have to now reapply and we will know, well not we, but the Board of Governors will know where they are and then hopefully can figure out a way that we can get them to the final stages. Thank you, A.G. This next question comes from Alman Desant from the Caribbean Broadcast Network. 2023 is the Silver Jubilee year for the St. Kitts Music Festival. What can you share regarding the planning for that event and particularly 
the promotion for the festival to Ghana patrons from all corners of the globe. Is there any, sorry, are there any major plans to interface with the tourism officials in Nevis to actively engage and encourage patrons to the music festival to truly enjoy two destinations for the price of one? Right, I think, Honorable <laughs> Masha. Yes. Okay, so the, this year we're celebrating <coughs> 25 years uh, of uh, the music festival. So 25 edition. And so in terms of the plans, we've announced an interim chair, uh, that is Alistair Williams. He works in the ministry. And we also have an interim uh, committee. The committee will be beefed up. In terms of the plans for the promotion of the event, we're hoping this year to do a themed festival uh, to celebrate the best of the years, the best of the artists uh, over the 25 years. Um, we are putting together, finalizing the artist selection committee. We are hoping to announce the first wave of artists within the next two weeks. We've given that commitment to the St. Kitts Nevis Tourism Authority, which is the organization responsible for promoting the event. We do intend to partner with Nevis in fact, we have started since, since last November, actually, uh, when we were in the UK and in the US. So we intend to sell not just the festival, but sell the two destinations as well. And so we're hoping this year to celebrate the full week where we will be offering to our visitors our immersive type of experiences when they come to the destination. So the hope is to get them to come in early, where they can immerse themselves in our rainforest, on our catamarans, and you know the other things that we have planned. And so, yes, we would be partnering with the Nevis Tourism Authority in promoting the music festival. Um, I'm not sure if that answers all of what was asked, but I'm hoping so. Thank you, Minister Henderson. Do we have any more questions from in-house? Jason Davis, ZIZ Broadcasting Corporation, once again. Um, persons living in the region know the woes of intra-regional intra travel. Mr. Prime Minister, has there been any talk amongst heads to easing the financial burden of traveling within the region? Possible lowering of taxes, a new airline, whatever might be there. Um, can we also get an update on ambassadors? I don't know if there have been any announced for ambassadors to the US or the OAS. Uh, Minister of Education, could you give us a further update on plans for the new Bastyr High School? And Minister Duggins, I understand that there may be some forward movement in the Ministry of the Creative Economy. Can you tell us what's going on there? All right, I would ask um, Minister Duggins to, to start. Yes, uh, pleasant morning to you, uh, to you all, and especially so, uh, Mr. Davis. As it relates to the creative economy, we've been doing quite a lot of work, as with all other ministries as well. But since you specifically refer to that ministry, I would like to speak on the work that has um, recently um, concluded, which is the hosting of our national carnival. And so that falls under the remit of the creative economy. And I think we would have seen some of what was exhibited there in terms of the display of our local artisans, our local culture, and just the, the bringing together of all aspects for economic development. Now, in 2023, we plan to expand on that work because for us, just being creative isn't the be all and end all. It is how you can have a viable, sustainable livelihood while being in your, your field. And so for far too long, our creatives had to look for other jobs to survive. And one of the things that we want to do in relation to that is um, <clears throat> work on training and development of our creatives. Because we recognize that a lot of them focus on the art and not so much on how to monetize the art. And so we've been developing workshops in areas of collaboration, especially with the Ministry of Small Business, to enhance that. But outside of that, there are some exciting plans afoot for the development of a creative art center. And I do believe that 
in short order, um, with some further consultation, we may be speaking as to when we'll be actually breaking ground on this uh, Creative Arts Center sometime in the near future. But outside of that, um, I think we are already well engaged in the planning of um, our national carnival for 2023-24. And um, unlike 22-23, where we were um, a bit late in, in, in our announcements, we want to start putting out things maybe as soon as June of this year, as far as uh, what the themes and costumes and different things would be like. Um, in fact, I've been asking my colleague minister if I could launch Carnival properly at the Sinkis Music Festival <laughs> and do um, something quite different this year. But our creatives are working. Um, there are also a number of ambassadors that we are looking at. Um, because we did speak about exporting our talent, right? And so we have a number of artists and, and, and DJs that are well in line to be um, cultural ambassadors. And we want to utilize our talent and spread the word regionally and internationally that St. Kitts is a con and Nevis, uh, together we are a country we reckon with when it comes to the creative industry. So I don't know if that answers your question sufficiently, but those are some of the areas we are developing in that space. Hmm. With regards to the, the bass, the high school, Jason, I don't know if you took your camera crew up there as yet to observe work that would have been done over the Christmas, or leading up to the Christmas um, vacation in regards that goes in full gear in a few weeks where the eastern side would be totally demolished and then on the western side you have the roofs and most of the buildings have been removed. Those will be taken down as well and of course it would also be an opportunity for our local architects and engineers to start thinking of what that space can look like as we'll be introducing or inviting persons to start showing us how the new Bastia High School will look like or can look like. Right. Um I can touch on the issue of the interregional travel. Also, I would also ask the Minister of Tourism to also comment on it. Um, as you know, interregional travel is a serious issue. At the OECS heads where authority, when we discussed it, it was a priority area, and we were also engaging the CDB to assist us in dealing with this, in dealing with this issue as well. I would also say that we have made positive steps to ensure that there is a pathway to deal with this. We have engaged regional airlines. We have also allotted within the budget about $8 million to deal directly with it. To say we have advanced discussion, to which the Minister of Tourism can also speak to, with a regional carrier in terms of resolving this issue. And we are also looking at developing St. Kitts and Nevis as a point where that airline can operate as well. So we have been addressing this issue, and we think that we are definitely getting there. It's a matter of priority, not just for me. You would have heard the Prime Minister of Grenada, Mitchell, would have also spoken to the issue of interregional travel. It is affecting communication, interaction. It's affecting business, commerce, the tourism product of the region. And so we have to address it and address it as quickly as possible. But I would like to say that St. Kitts and Nevis is well along the path of having a response, a tangible response to this critical matter. So just to follow up on what the Honorable Prime Minister said in terms of the 
issues of interregional travel. We are in discussions with a regional carrier. Uh, we are still negotiating, and so I'm, I can't say much, but what I can say is um, based on discussions and if they go as we would want them to, we should have the issues resolved within a period of, uh, I'm told, six to nine weeks um, as it relates specifically to SENCITS. Uh, we are hoping as well from the negotiations that we can be a hub, meaning we can be a central point uh, between the northern and okay. southern islands within the region. All of that is being negotiated. But as it relates to travel from St. Kitts to the southern part of the, the Caribbean and the northern part, that, if discussions go well, should be in place between six to nine weeks. And I hope my CEO who's listening doesn't have to lash me when I get back to the office because he's asked to be to not say too much since we're still in the process of negotiating. Thank you, ministers. Um, Mr. Davis, if, I'm, if I heard correctly, we're asking about an update on ambassadors. Okay. Right. So the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Senior Minister, he's not here. He's away on official government business. Um, but I would say that in very, very, very short order, we will have an answer for you. As a matter of fact, we look at the, the U.S. Embassy and the OAS, and we are seeking to have a different approach um, to it as to how it was approached to by the last government. And therefore, we'll have an answer very, very shortly. I will say within a week or so. I, I am not, the reason why I'm not announcing anything at this point in time is that the Minister of Foreign Affairs is not here. And I don't think it will be in order for me to do that. But I can tell you, within very short order, that will be um, answered. I think all of the other posts are filled, and that is the last one that we seek to fill. A critical one, a very important one, as we have extremely good relations with the United States of America. And we continue to push forward to make sure that those relations continue strong and can advance even. So in quick order, I think the Minister of Foreign Affairs would have a definite answer to that question. Thank you, PM. We go back to the virtual platform. Nevis has just commissioned, recently commissioned a facility for recycling. What is in the pipeline for St. Kitts? St. Kitts and Nevis made a commitment to stay below 1.5 degrees Celsius having recently participated in COP27. The UK has recently placed a ban on single-use plastics near, on single-use plastics. Nearby in Sabre, some supermarkets do not allow the use of plastics, plastic bags. How soon are we to follow? All right, and that question goes to the Minister of Sustainable Development, Climate Action, Environment. Honorable Joya. <clears throat> Thank you for that question. Excellent question. Always pleasing to know that our press is still interested in the environment and sustainable development. With regards to our regional commitment to 1.5 PCLA, the Ministry of Environment and Climate Action continues with that agenda. In fact, as it relates to, I think it's a two-part question, so we are maintaining our commitment to that particular agenda. In fact, um, some of the projects which are tied to that commitment, including our, our commitment to the Montreal Protocol and protecting the ozone layer, we, are recently, we have recently engaged students at CFPC to partner with us in data collection and we have engaged the environmental science and geography students and natural science students to ensure that they are part of the, what we call the public, private, and academic partnership for environment and sustainable development. In terms of our single-use plastic ban, so let's just make it regional. We are the only Caribbean, the only country in the OECS that has not yet banned plastic, single-use plastics. And if I'm transparent, that's not a fault of this current government, but really the lack of momentum from the previous administration. However, we have made the commitment 
to get this done by the end of the year. Our Attorney General already has all of our relevant legislation on the agenda for this year. It requires, however, a second phase of communication with private, the private sector, the Chamber of Industry, with producers of plastics, with our supermarkets, our hotel and tourism industry. In fact, the PS for Tourism already reached out to our ministry about partnership in terms of how we, their Venture Deeper campaign as well as their sustainable, the IAS, DMC, the Sustainable Development Council could partner with the Ministry of Environment in terms of making the single-use plastic ban a reality. It's not just going to affect the consumers who go to the supermarkets, but also the tourism sector <coughs> importers. Also, most importantly, for the Ministry of Agriculture and the ministry, small businesses, our vendors. So even though we can, in six months, institute, implement the, have the legislation without the community buy-in and without the private sector, we're going to have problems. They are ready, but we have to get people there. It also requires very deep and strategic conversations with customs in terms of what do we allow and how do we monitor import and the buy-in and education from the public so that we do not have a situation where supermarkets and consumers start hoarding plastic bags because you hear that in six months you're not allowed to use plastic bags. We also need to give our creative sector the opportunity to be creative and inventive in terms of the reusable bag designs that we want to implement. So everybody would now be having an opportunity to market their, their product with their handbags. So the, the Ministry of Environment will be meeting this week, has been meeting really, and will be confirming our strategic plan for engaging the general public on the single-use plastic issue and by the end of the year we will be closer to that ban. I don't want to use, just like the AG, it's not advisable to use timelines, but we're not seeing January 2023 without some real, 2024, without some serious movement on the single-use plastic ban. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Clark. Before I turn over for the PM to wrap up, We'll have one more question from in-house. Kindly remember that all questions are to be directed to the Prime Minister. Good day. Okay. Les Roy Williams, SKNIS. This question is again for the Minister of Environment and Climate Action, Honorable Dr. Joyal Clark. Yes. But directed through the Prime Minister. Yes. <laughs> and the question has to do with coming out of COP 27 in Egypt. One of the big decisions that was made had to do with the creation of a loss and damage fund. Could you give us an update on that? If there has been any further development in relation to that. Thank you again for your question. I, may I speak to the last question that I missed, which was, no, I miss it again. Recycling, yes, the Ministry of Environment joined Nevis, the, the, the Nevis Island Administration and their own solid waste corporation in the opening of their plastic recycling plant. Recently, the amb Ambassador Lynn and myself, we spoke about the technical challenges that we're having at the solid waste landfill in St. Kitts in terms of implementing our own recycling plant, and it's a matter of energy. The Minister of Energy can speak to it that every industry requires some amount of energy generation, and we had that problem. However, we have been managing the challenge, and we have a less than three month timeline in terms of solving the energy generation problem at the plant so that we can implement our own recycling, plastic recycling plant and packaging plant at the solid waste landfill. I must say, however, that Recycle SKN, we need, and we spoke in cabinet on Monday about the fact that every ministry will be joining the ICDF in terms of recycling our plastic bottles. We're gonna have a focal point from the Ministry of Environment who would be contacting all of the relevant PSs in every ministry 
and we're joining the Office of the Prime Minister, an initiative led by Prime Minister's Office and the Cabinet Secretariat in terms of collecting your plastic bottles. Some of you who were here earlier saw when I came in, I moved all of the plastic bottles from, almost all, <laughs> from the head table, because we cannot be an island that promotes sustainable island, um, a sustainable island state agenda, and then have plastic bottles everywhere, not join our partners, our critical partners, Taiwanese, in terms of recycling the plastic bottles. Now, in terms of COP27, and we're heading to COP28, first thing I want to say is that we have made a decision to expand our delegation for COP28, and I'm putting the Prime Minister and his um, office and call right now. He's joining our delegation and leading the delegation in, 20, in, 28, in COP28 in November, right? Right. right. <laughs> and the department has been working very closely with the mission the mission the, in, in the New York mission in terms of selecting persons. One, we have selected another young person who would be part of our OASIS delegation. So they have one full year of training and development to lead on the loss and damage conversation. Two, we joined the regional conversation to identify focal points and regional heads to sit on the transitional committee for loss and damage, and we supported delegation from Barbados, delegates from Barbados and Suriname. And three, we're continuing our own local work, which is a mandate from COP27, to have what we call a mini COP, so that more young persons could join the needed conversation on loss and damage. It's also linked to a lot of the regional work we're doing, we recently received an invitation from Sinterstatius to visit their island in terms of their recycling and also in terms of their own approach to loss and damage and their education system. And finally, we recognize also the need for education. Now, in our, in our visit to our the state, Prime Minister's state visit to Taiwan, one of the things that stood out was the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, and the fact that their mandate started with preschoolers. And that's something that we are now in conversation with the Ministry of Education, as well as with the Department of Gender, in terms of getting students involved at the preschool level to understand the message of recycling and 1.5 to stay alive, as well as bringing more young women on board with our 1.5 to stay alive and loss, loss and damage agenda. Apologies for being so long with me. Thank you, Dr. Clark. Right. I, I want to thank you very much for that question because yesterday when I met with the ambassador, the Canadian ambassador to the region, we discussed a lot about COP27 and loss and damage and the support that would have gotten from Canada. So some big players would have come on board to see this through. And so we are pursuing this um, as, as well. But one of the things that we recognize is that the young people have to play a, fun, play a fundamental role um, in all of this, and I'm happy that the minister did mention that. Uh, minister Eislin, who's our minister of youth, of course, she plays a very fundamental role um, with respect to the integration of young people when it comes to these um, projects that we are pursuing with respect to climate action, environment, and so forth. And I'll give a, an opportunity to update us on that. Thank you very much, Prime Minister. Uh, so just an update in terms of the plans and how we continue to try to mainstream youth in the development thrust for the Federation for Sustainability. Of course, we would have had conversations with the Minister of Environment. That is certainly an area where we do want more young people involved. And the Department of Youth is actually in the process of putting together a strategic plan for the year in terms of how we will, um, what activities and opportunities for programming that we will do. And we do seek to continue being able to partner with our ministries. So I know we would have had opportunities and um, efforts from the Ministry of Tourism in the ways that they connect with uh, young people at the CFBC in order to engage them in uh, tourism and opportunities for employment as well as small business and development. And so we continue to see and be able to identify opportunities for our young people to be able to uh, gain opportunities to be involved in all areas of development. 
and one of the areas that I know um, has been a major issue uh, on the minds of young people is always employment. And so I want to say that um, there is a plan to put together a task force around youth unemployment so that we can identify um, what the data is to find out what are the areas and also to be able to find solutions to youth unemployment. So that is some of the plans that we have moving forward. Right, well, one of the things that's critical for St. Kitts and Nevis, and especially St. Kitts, and we have to be very proactive with this, is the, is the issue of the water issue, the water issue and the energy, and the energy issue. I'll ask the, the minister if he can give us an update on that. <coughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Prime Minister and cabinet colleagues <coughs> for all of the very good um, contributions here today. Water is life, I've said so. Um, we need to believe it, we need to practice it. Water is life and every drop counts. And this government has um, been determined to take water seriously. And we have shown that not in just word, but in action. In the last budget that was passed, we increased the budget for water by 260%. In 2022, before we took office, the budget was $8.7 million. Um, the budget of 2023 is $22.7 million, an increase of $14 million. <clears throat> that shows the commitment of the government to deal with the water issue. I want to stress that there has been no investment, no attention paid to water for seven years. That is not an understatement. Oh, sorry, that is not an overstatement. Um, there, has not, there has been no investment whatsoever. And so we come in on the heels of a national crisis, but I want to say this, say this emphatically, that this government, under this ministry, will solve the water problem. Just by way of um, some information, um, as I mentioned before, 70% of our water comes from groundwater, that is water that percolates through the soil and res resides in our reservoirs, in our aquifers. 30% is surface water. That is what rain, in, uh, rain falls in the mountains. It runs down and we capture it from um, some seven rivers also that we have, seven small rivers. We have about 7.5 million gallons worth of storage. Presently, however, St. Kitts is only able to produce 5.6 million gallons of water per day. However, we need about 7 million gallons to have 24-hour seven um, supply. So we are only producing 5.6 million, but we need 7 million gallons um, per day. What that means is we cannot provide 24-hour seven um, water. <coughs> In the Bastia region, you need about 4 million gallons of water. The Bastia Aquifer gives us about, or can give us about 2 million. Many years ago, it was determined that the safe yield from the Bastia Aquifer should be about 2.5 million gallons a day. With the reduced rainfall, rainfall has decreased by almost 20% in the last 10 years, um, which is what is recharging our um, aquifers. Um, we can assume that our safe yield from the Bastia Aquifer has also decreased to about 2 million gallons a day. But I will report that we have been over-extracting our aquifer in the last couple of years. What does that mean? In every aquifer, you have fresh water, and usually below that you have salt water. There is a barrier between the two, salt water and fresh water barrier. Um, this experts expect, the experts are saying that we are right on the border of that salt water and fresh water line. We have to stop pumping at the rate we are pumping out of our aquifers. Now some people may ask, and I've heard the question many times over, and I want to repeat it as I did in the budget. Conris Maynard, Dr. Drew, Cabinet, <clears throat> we had this big downpour in a rain. I think cabinet evening we had one when we were ending. And a lot of water we see in the streets running off to the um, sea. Why don't we capture that water and store it um, to help our water issue? It's a great question. Firstly, when it rains, about 80% of the water that falls 
we lose it either through evaporation or through the trees and the leaves and the vegetation that uses that water. About 18% of that water goes to our aquifers. 18% of the rain that falls goes to our aquifer. Only about 2% runs off to the sea. Just about 2%. So, <clears throat> let us say we decided, the Prime Minister said, you know what, we're not going to do anything else, but we're going to build 7 million gallons worth of storage tomorrow. 7 million, which is a lot. It will cost a lot of money to do that. We need space, and we also need to be able to direct that 2% that's running off to the sea to those tanks. But let's say we were able to do that. 7 million gallons of storage tomorrow. Well, remember what our demand is? 7 million gallons per day. So even if we caught all of that water that we could to fill up those 7 million tanks on Monday night, today is Wednesday, all of that water would be finished. So the point is, is that we need a constant source of that. And with rainfall being reduced by 20%, and we are going into the dry season, we are going to have weeks where we don't have water running off in our guts or on our streets like that. And so building 7 million gallons of storage, 14 million gallons of storage, 21 million gallons of storage, even 50 million gallons of storage is not the solution because we don't have any water to put in the 50 million gallons of storage. What we have, what we do not have, is a storage problem. What we do have is a source problem. In countries like Dominica, or let's say in the United States, or big countries, where you have rivers that you can go and visit that are continuously running because there's rain or snow melting in some area, causing those rivers to flow all the time. That is a renewable source of water. And so you can use those to fill storage. We do not have that. Our biggest reservoir is our aquifer. So even if you say build 7 million gallons worth of storage, it cannot compete to the storage we already have in our aquifer that will hold billions of gallons of water. But with the reduced rainfall, that is diminishing. Um, but it is important to note, however, that we've only explored about 60% of that. We will continue as a government to explore the other 40% which resides outside of the Bastia region. So outside of the Bastia region, we will continue to drill. So that brings me to Bede, who will be commencing drilling in the Kayon area to hopefully give us about 500,000 gallons of water per day if that well is successful. When they're finished there, there's one more well in Bastia, the Shadwell area, which we want to rectify so that we could possibly get another 500,000 gallons there possibly. But we have now reached to the point where we need a renewable source of water. Now, where can we find a renewable source of water on a small island like St. Kitts? Where is water? Is it anywhere at all? Is it close by? Is it in a hill somewhere? It's right out there in the sea. We can't dun the sea, at least not in this lifetime or <laughs> lifetimes to come. And because of climate change with our ice caps melting, sea levels are actually rising. So we need to use that water. And so what this government has realized is that the time has come for us to invest in the desalination of water. That is what is going to provide for us a buffer, at least in the Bastia region, um, for us to augment the supply of water while we still do our drilling. And so the cabinet has approved in principle the concept that we will proceed on desalination water and we have a proposal before us that not only does desalination of water, one of the critical things about desalination of water is that it requires a lot of energy. We have our own energy problems where we are not able to provide enough energy to meet our peak demand. And so this proposal actually comes along with renewable energy. And so we have approved in principle this particular proposal as, uh, as long as all of the things check out, all of the due diligence, and all of the, everything that's associated with doing a project checks out, um, we have given approval in principle for that. So I want you to know that the government is working to solve this water problem, and it's not going to take seven years. It's not going to take five years. It's not going to take three years. It's not going to take two years. 
But we say we're not giving timelines, but that's just a clue, right? So we are going to solve the water issue. Um, rest assured that that is a priority of this government. Thank you very much, uh, Minister. Very, very, very comprehensive. I mean, what is being highlighted here is that we met a country <coughs> without adequate water and without any plan. At, without any plan and without adequate energy. Electricity is a serious problem and water is a serious problem and these are two very basic things for the development of any country. But we intend to address them and address them aggressively, especially during the course of this year. We want to take water as an issue off the table and energy as an issue off the table so that we can concentrate on other issues of nation building. One of the Mr. things... Mm -hmm. Mr. PM, yes. you, you wanted me to address the energy too? You, you asked about water. Right, I asked about water. Um, what I would do, I, I'll, I'll come back to that, no okay. problem. Um, but I want to ask the AG to address a particular matter. Um, I think we have enough time. And then I'll come back to the Minister for Energy. The issue of integrity in public life, anti-corruption, <coughs> the marijuana issue. In other words, good governance. I would like you to update the country as to where we are going as far as the legislative agenda on those critical matters. Answer. Good morning again, everyone. The good governance legislation will be read for the first time in Parliament on February 8th, 2023. That will include the anti-corruption bill, the freedom of information amendment bill, the integrity in public life amendment bill, and we've added the official Gazette bill. What these legislations do is that they create a good governance infrastructure for, to control the, the operations of government. The reason that we've added the official Gazette bill is so that people can have full access to the laws of this country. When I was in the meeting, the Commonwealth Law Ministers meeting, I had a very, very long discussion with the one of the senior officials in the Seychelles Attorney General's chambers, and he said that since they created the Official Gazette Act, which allows all laws to be published online, not just showing up at the government printry, they have, they have seen the impact that has had in educating the people about the laws of their country. So we want to include that in our good governance package. We are waiting for input on the anti-corruption bill, which was circulated last November, um, from the Bar Association who promised to get back to us very soon, the Chamber of Industry and Commerce who's promised to get back to us, and the Christian Council. But whether they get back to us or not, we are proceeding because that is a promise made and it will be a promise that is kept. Um, in relation to the, the marijuana issue, there are a couple of approaches that we are taking. First of all, we're expanding the Criminal Records Rehabilitation of Offenders Act to cover most minor marijuana offenses so that those persons who were convicted in the, pa in the past of minor marijuana offenses can proceed with their lives. Not only are we doing that, but the Medical Cannabis Authority leadership is discussing with the, between the Ministry of Agriculture and, and the Attorney General's Chambers amendments to the Cannabis Act, which governs the medical marijuana industry. We hope to get those on stream very soon. But Two other matters that we are addressing, three other matters we are addressing in relation to the marijuana issue, because you have to look at it holistically. What we are doing is we are finally bringing effect um, to the decisions that were made in the Sankofa case by creating a Rastafarian place of worship legislation to, give, um, to bring effect to the, the statements and the judgments that were made um, with regard to the religious right to practice the sacrament um, in the Rastafarian, um, I, they said don't call it a religion, in Rastafari, and we are going to legitimize that and allow the, the, the Rastafarian community to have their designated places of worship where they can participate in their sacrament fully. In that regard, we're also looking at the public health aspects of that, and we are going to create a public health um, smoking in public legislation, which will, and the, and the Minister of, of Tourism and the Minister of Entertainment, we've discussed that with them, where there can be designated areas for smoking in, at events, um, even at um, 
um, establishments, um, social establishments, so that persons who just do not want to participate or, or, or be affected, their health might be affected by smoke in whichever way, they will have their section, and the persons who want to smoke recreationally will have their section. Tobacco. And yes, oh yes, they it won't just be cannabis, it's all smoke. So we were dealing with that um, legislation. And we are also going to finally bring into force the, the constitutional right to cultivate um, in the privacy of your home. The National, National Cannabis um, Authority in 2019 in their report, one of the suggestions, one of the recommendations um, was that persons be allowed to cultivate five marijuana cannabis trees in the privacy of their home. And in the Sankofa decision, it was found that, it, that the legislation prohibiting cultivation completely was unconstitutional. So that person should be allowed in the privacy of their own home to smoke and in the privacy of their own home to cultivate a certain amount. So we're going to bring life by way of legislation to that ruling of the court. So those things, we have three scheduled parliament sittings, and over those three sittings, over the next, I believe it's six weeks, we will see all of these different um, pieces of legislation presented for the first time, and to have debates, and to bring a change to the way we operate um, in St. Kitts and Nevis. Thank you very much. I wanted the Minister of Energy to touch on the issue of um, energy, but I'm told that I have two more minutes as some stations might be leaving. So um, I'll give the Minister of Energy another opportunity to present that, and he would have definitely much more information. But I basically, this morning, so huh? I was on radio this morning before. Okay. Before, oh, energy, okay. So, so he has already yeah. spoken about energy, correct. Basically, what I want to say is that this is your federal cabinet. We were elected to office on 5th August 2022. We presented to the people seven pillars on which we will lead the government and we are on that path. We said that good governance will be the foundation for everything else to be built on. And we are also serious about it. We are not a perfect administration. We will not be perfect. But I want to say to our people that we'll be working very hard and we will be sincere. And the opportunities that present themselves for us to really advance, we will take care of them. We expect challenges. We expect setbacks. But I want you to know that we'll keep our feet on the gas pedal to move our country and our people forward. I want to thank every single one of the ministers in the country. They are hard workers, experts in various ministries. That is what is really aiding this young administration to accomplish so much in such short time. We are not guessing. We are not making up as we go. We have a plan, and the plan is coming to fruition. So I want to say to the people of St. Kitts and Nevis, thank you once again for choosing the Sink It's Navy's Labour Party to lead the government. We will work hard to make you proud. We will work hard so you can say, yes, this was the right choice. And as we continue to go forward, you will definitely see the work from this very hard-working team, the A team. A couple of things that we are addressing quickly, the minimum wage. I've informed the Minister of Labour, and she's going to move to get the committee or the parties together to look at the minimum wage issue. We also are looking at the student loan issue and we are looking at the energy cost issue because we are subsidizing energy significantly here in St. Kitts and Nevis. And so we want to update the country on those things. And so we are not just waiting for you to bring issues up. We know what the plan is and we will proactively present the plan as we go along so that we can follow together. And I ask for the help, the cooperation, the input of our citizenry. We cannot do it without you. We need you. Everything we do, you are definitely the focus. And with that, 
I want to say thank you once again and say thanks to the team that has been working extremely hard to make sure that St. Kitts and Nevis becomes number one. Thank you very much. God bless all of you. Thank you, Prime Minister, for your closing remarks. Thanks to the media for coming, because without your presence and participation, this would not have been possible. Thanks, and thanks to the listening and viewing audience as well. Have a good day.